software developers are weird. I should know. I'm one of them. And I didn't want it to be this way. I had no hand in the matter. It is purely genetic. <sighs> I'm Egyptian, and my father was one of the early Egyptian computer science and engineering students to work with computers when they first entered the country in the 60s and 70s. Now, when I say computers, they're not computers like me and you know today. They were mainframes that filled an entire room. And there were two parts to this mainframe. One part is where you would write assembly language code, which is just one level above machine code, and it would put out a punch card with that code. And then in the other part of the mainframe is where you put in the punch card, and it runs the code, and it gives you the output or tells you if there's an error. Now, when this entered the country, the two major universities fought over the mainframe. They each wanted it for their engineering students. And then they came to a compromise. We'll split it. So one university in one location got the part of the mainframe where you'd write the code and it would give you the punch card, and the other university got the part where you put in the punch card and it runs the code. So there was my father in his funky bell bottoms and afro and handlebar mustache, writing code in one university and then taking the punch card and getting on a bus for 30 minutes to get to the other university and putting in the punch card and praying to God that it runs correctly. Because if not, he's going to get back on the bus for 30 minutes and over and over again. And apparently, this was such a fun and joyous experience for him that he wanted the same for his only son. And when I was about eight years old, he pulled me away from whatever fun childhood experience I was having and decided to teach me how to code. Now, by that time, it wasn't assembly language. There were newer languages like BASIC, which was many levels more of abstraction and simplicity higher. Of course, by today's standards, extremely archaic. But back then, it was at least simple enough to teach a young eight-year-old the basics of computer science. But I rebelled instantly. I told him, I don't want to sit at a computer all day like a nerd. So my dad sighed and he said, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And without hesitation, I told him two things. One, I want to be a wrestler in the World Wrestling Federation like Hulk Hogan. And two, I want to write stories like Roald Dahl. And because the second thing was slightly less insane than the first, he supported me. And he bought me as many books as I wanted and encouraged me to write as much as I could. And I totally forgot about programming until I got to high school. And then there was a mandatory programming class. And at that time, there were newer programming languages that were much easier than BASIC. But despite my least efforts, somehow I managed to get one of the highest grades in class. And I remember as I was looking at my test result, I thought, oh, damn, am I a nerd? I don't feel like a nerd. Because at that point, I was just getting into electronic music and raves, and these two things did not align. They did not align. So I hid that. Result, as if I had gotten an F. I didn't want anyone to know I was good at this until I got to university. And then my father asked me, what major do you want? And I told him two things. I'm going to major in philosophy and writing. And by the way, it doesn't matter much because anyway, I'm going to become a famous DJ and producer like Fatboy Slim. And my father said, okay. Um, well, you can always sit under a tree and think about life and write. You don't need a degree for that. And in case the DJing doesn't work out, how about you get a computer science degree just as a fallback? Which was a good point. And then he made another good point, which is that he pays for my tuition. <laughs> so we both agreed that I would take the computer science major, begrudgingly. But I knew that I was going to become a famous DJ and producer and be cool. And then a few years later, I was up late working in my beats laboratory, making sick beats and cutting up samples. And then in the music production software I was using, it included plugins. And there was one plugin, I couldn't get it to sound like how I wanted. And then I realized that these plugins come with script files, and you can access them and make changes if you could. And I opened up the script file, and I realized I know this programming language. So I was able to make the changes. And then after I made the changes, I realized, well, wouldn't it be cool if it does this? And I started to add more and more to the plugin file until it became three times the size and had 10 times more features. And about 10 hours later, I stopped horrified at what's happening. 
And I said, oh, damn. And then I begrudgingly went a bit deeper into the software rabbit hole. But I knew this is still temporary. One day I'm going to be cool. And then I got to become a senior software developer in a major software house, handling a very complex and big project. And I was there late one night. Everyone had gone, and I had just started checking the log files before I go. I put on my jacket, and my wife calls me saying, hey, just checking, when are you coming home so that we can plan for dinner? And I told her, and just as I was talking to her, I realized there's a bug in the logs. And a bug is something that goes wrong in code. Now, there's two kinds of bugs. There's the kind of bug that's pretty simple, and you could fix it quite quickly. And then there's the second kind of bug, which takes you into the depths of hell and to the brinks of your own sanity. This was the second kind. But I didn't know that at that point. And I told her, yeah, I'm just going to be probably home in about 15 minutes. I just need to check this. And she said, great, because I'm making your favorite, sweet and sour chicken. And I told her, that sounds amazing, baby. I love you. I'll see you in 15 minutes. And I started checking the logs and doing a bit of traces, and everything seemed correct. I don't understand what's going on. Everything is running correctly. And then I waited for the error to happen, and it didn't. So I put my jacket back on, about to leave. The error happens again. How is this possible? Why is it random? Why is it not happening every time at a certain situation? And then every 15 minutes, my wife would send me a message. Where are you? When are you coming home? And I tell her, just 15 more minutes. I, I think I know what it is. Just 15 more I'll be there in 15 minutes. An hour passes, three hours, five hours. My wife sends me one final SMS containing one single emoji. And I can't tell you what that emoji is. <laughs> but it's not one of the good ones. And I did not have sweet and sour chicken that evening. And I tried to figure out what the bug was, and I couldn't. For three days, by the day three, I was a shell of the man I was on day one because I would stay up so late, not figure it out, go home, sleep, dream of the code, wake up thinking I had figured it out, go back to work early, still hunt for the bug. My wife stopped sending me messages, and I think she started to communicate with a divorce lawyer at the time. <laughs> but on the evening of the third night, I thought of something. And it was something I learned in university, but I had never really seen it in the field. There was this thing called a race condition, which happens randomly when different parts of the system are inserting and reading from a table, and you're expecting them to have a certain sequence. But for whatever reason, one of them becomes a bit slow, and the sequence changes. And this is a very rare thing, but it is known. So I made the necessary adjustments, and I put the logs, and I waited. One hour, two hours, three hours. The bug didn't happen. I finally figured out the bug. And I let out such a massive scream of joy that the security in the ground floor came up to my floor with guns drawn, thinking I was being brutally murdered. But I didn't care. I can't make the sound I made, but it looked a little bit like this. Yeah! Those three days culminating in that moment was maybe some of the most joy I've ever felt in my life, possibly tied with the birth of my first child and far ahead of the birth of my second. <laughs> and it was at that moment that I realized two things. First, I am a software developer, and I love it, and there's nothing cooler. And the second thing is... I was looking for role models all around without realizing I had a great professional role model at home. And I called my dad right then, and I told him this. And there was a few seconds of silence, and then he said, Sorry, Baba, I so like I said, software developers are weird. We love to solve complex problems and figure out ways to create better solutions. It's, for most of us, be beyond just a job. It's something we find true meaning in. But things are changing, and it's due to generative AI. And we're all in this transformational wave right now, and it's growing exponentially. 
And right now, I'm the principal tech evangelist at Amazon Web Services, AWS. So I have a very specific view on the paradox that's unfolding. Because on one hand, there's never been a better time to be an innovator because it's never been easier to bring your idea to life. On the other hand, things are happening so quickly that it's very disorienting. And people are unable to quite figure out with this rate of change, where do they fit in and where does AI fit in, especially with software and AI. But to truly understand how these two world, world, worlds are merging, we need to go back to the ninth century but stay in the Middle East. And our ancient scholars weren't just extremely smart. Many of them were polymaths. And what a polymath is is someone who has expertise in a variety of fields. And this allowed them to connect the dots between astronomy, philosophy, art, music, medicine, and create truly groundbreaking breakthroughs. And maybe one of the most notable is Al-Khwarizmi, who wrote a text in the ninth century that first introduced the concept of the algorithm. And an algorithm is the set of steps needed to solve a problem. And it's still one of the fundamental concepts of computer science today. And now if we go to the 20th century, from east to west, from a big beard to mutton chops, we go to Isaac Asimov. He was one of the most prolific science fiction authors to ever exist. And in the 1940s, his stories about worlds where robots and AI coexist with humans and the implications of this inspired an entire generation of thinkers, artists, and scientists, including, it is said, the people who attended the Dartmouth Conference. Now, these brainiacs got together to talk about how can we make machines think? But then they realized they first have to ask another question. How do we think? And out of those conversations came groundbreaking AI research into natural language processing and neural networks. Then in 1997, we watched our chess grandmaster champion, Garry Kasparov, go up against IBM's Deep Blue a very rudimentary form of AI that's only trained to play chess, and the entire world was shocked to watch our champion lose to the machine at chess, the thinking man's game. In the 2010s, we started to see machine learning improve the personalized recommendations on sites like Amazon and different streaming sites, and we stopped getting spam in our email inbox because it was able to filter it. But only when four elements converged did we get generative AI as we understand it, and it started with a new algorithm, over a century after Al-Khwarizmi introduced the concept of the algorithm. And this new algorithm was the transformer model. The transformer is the T in GPT. And this transformer model was a new algorithm in the world of AI that allowed the AI to not just predict and classify based on data, but generate entirely new data. But this algorithm needed an enormous amount of public data. But to be able to train that public data through this transformer model, you needed dedicated processors and very powerful GPUs. And to do that in a scalable method, you needed cloud computing. And this is how these four elements came together. And this is how generative AI came to be and was born. And now, it's fundamentally changing software development and the nature of software developers. Because now, you can use natural language, English sentences, to generate code. Once again, going many more levels of abstraction higher than the days when my dad was writing assembly code on those punch cards. Generative AI can write code, explain code, debug code, document code, port code from one language to another. It can build a front end, it can build a back end, it could connect the two. So then it begs the question, if generative AI can do so many of those tasks, traditionally software developers do, then what's left for software developers to do? In other words, what do devs do when they don't dev? And is it still worth learning how to code? I believe, yes, 100%. And here's why. It's because developers are weird. And it's precisely because of our strange irrational, unpredictable paths, going after things that are exciting to us, chasing these curiosities of developing solutions, struggling for days over complex problems. It's that lived experience that teaches us how to connect the right dots for future software 
projects. And this lived experience is where we build our unique expertise. And this lived experience is not public data, and it's not accessible by generative AI. Therefore, a software developer who knows what they're doing plus generative AI has such a massive edge over just generative AI. And it's due to two things, context and complexity. Because software development is not just coding. Generative AI can produce code fast, sure, but it lacks the true contextual understanding between mediocre code and excellent software that scales. AI can create a simple prototype, sure, but the more complex the project gets, the more it will add technical debt and likely cause a lot of future heart attacks when things go wrong and we don't understand what happened. AI can generate a solution, but it doesn't understand if it's the best solution for this particular team in this new business use case. Context helps us connect the right dots, and it's the difference between intelligence and wisdom. And I've been thinking about this, not just for the work I do with current developers, but for future developers. Because right now, Luli, my daughter, is 10 years old. And I believe that 100% this is the time to start coding. And I decided I'm going to teach her to start coding. And the day I decided, I had butterflies in my stomach. And as I walked up the steps to teach her, I was filled with emotion. I was hearing sirens. I felt like I'm part of this cosmic grand story right now. And I reached her room, and I knocked on the door, and I went in, and she was on her iPad. And I said, hey, Luli. And she said, hi, Baba. And I said, how about I teach you how to code? And she said, I know how to code. <laughs> and I said, huh? <laughs> and she came over and showed me on her iPad all of the gamified coding apps that she's been learning, all of the fundamentals of programming, computer science, and the generative AI threads creating a website and the business plan for that website. And I just stood there staring at her. And I said, oh, damn. Thank you. <laughs>